Um, Robert Perrins, who is up with us very late uh, in Brisbane. He's an associate professor at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. Uh, he's also a member of the expert group on resource management. Um, as you've just done with Milan, please use that chat room. Uh, Rob, the floor is yours. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry about the technical gremlin there. Uh, I don't know exactly where the sound cut out last time, so I'm basically going to just go through the the intro again. Uh, it's it's my absolute pleasure to be speaking today to the expert group on resource management. Um, I just want to connect uh, the topic uh, that well, that I'm discussing today with that larger overarching narrative uh, that that Scott mentioned in his introductory remarks. Um, and indeed something that we heard Milan also kind of echo. Uh, as we are trying to figure out a pathway to getting all the resources that we're going to need in the future, there's a lot of question marks. There is a lot of uncertainty about several dimensions of this. How are we going to do that? But one of the things that I don't think anybody doubts is that technology will be uh, a, a very important part of how we try to, to achieve these, these things. And artificial intelligence has very much uh, come into the frame as one of the technologies that will probably play a materially relevant role uh, as we try to, to achieve those efficiencies. So uh, among the things that I want to talk about in the only the, a few slides in only a few minutes is I want to give a quick status report. We've had some early forays into the, uh, into the artificial intelligence domain uh, in the context of resource management. And we've learned a few things along the way from those early experiments. Some of the things that happened were, were very good, were very worthwhile, uh, and that delivered real value and improved efficiency. But at the same time, there were several things that did not. So uh, what can we glean from both of those types of experiments, those both uh, successful and not quite so successful? And then by looking at both of those uh, things, does that shed any useful light on where to next? How best to apply AI as we move forward in the resource sector? Harry, next slide, please. Just a, a quick word about where the information is coming from, where the data is coming from that I'm going to be uh, invoking as I kind of try to make these points. Much of it comes from the Intel Corporation. Uh, they've done a lot of thinking about artificial intelligence. Uh, and connecting it to the topics, the specific topics that we're discussing here. Um, and I've also had some useful side discussions about this with PwC, the global consulting company, and a small company in Australia, a service provider called Powered. Next slide. So there's a lot of uh, terminology kind of swirling around uh, in this area. Uh, you've probably heard in the media, you know, phrases like deep learning, like machine learning. And those are basically subsets of a larger discussion uh, about artificial intelligence. So just to kind of make sure we have a shared understanding of what do I mean uh, by that phrase as we kind of move forward here. To my thinking, artificial intelligence is basically the science of getting machines to mimic the behavior and the thinking of humans. Next slide. Now, uh, it's a little too simplistic to treat it all like it's one big homogeneous uh, technology. The truth of the matter is that there's a bit of a spectrum here. And on one side of the spectrum, you've got on the left-hand side here, narrow AI. Uh, and that's basically more, it's been historically aimed at performing a single task. It doesn't really handle uh, the tasks and concepts that it hasn't really, that it hasn't been explicitly taught before. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you've got deep AI. And the purists, uh, people who are very familiar with AI types of topics, probably would say, well, actually, there's even a third category called artificial superintelligence that's even beyond deep AI. But that, for the most part, is still uh, the, the exclusive uh, domain of, of science fiction. So uh, it, we're not really there yet. So I'll leave that third category out and just kind of break it down into two. So deep AI... That's what more, more faithfully mimics human intelligence. Uh, and that's uh, basically it's about giving machines the ability to learn and apply intelligence to solve any problem, not just a specific one like you had over on the left hand side, but but something where the, the system can kind of go beyond those boundaries and just start figuring stuff out on its own. The thing about deep AI, though, is that we really haven't seen a lot of uh, evidence of successful applications where real value and real efficiencies have been achieved. 
Uh, we're making baby steps in that direction, but it's it's been mostly elusive so far. Where we are seeing value added is in in the narrow AI parts. And in the resource sector, that's frequently happening because solutions that were created elsewhere in the marketplace, in other industries, have been imported into the resource sector and almost used verbatim with a little bit of tweaking and, and fiddling. Uh, so most of the su successful implementations of, of AI that we read about uh, in the resource sector, most of it is happening in that left column, in narrow AI. One quick example of this is that there's an energy company right here in Australia where I am, uh, and they were collaborating with a, a global technology service provider. And they came up with basically a, a solution for uh, for rifling through very efficiently massive amounts of archival data sets and using artificial intelligence to go through multiple decades, like 40 plus years worth of historical records, numerical data, uh, notes that were written about, you know, about the, the situation of a particular uh, the system uh, going back for several decades. And so very efficiently, this system is able to kind of go through all of that information and crystallize the data so that today's engineers have that holistic understanding of all the things that have ever been said and recorded and done with regards to those assets. So, but again, like I said, uh, these are kind of very localized. They, they don't fulfill the def definition of deep AI. There's still those baby step narrow, narrow AI applications. Next slide. So this begs the question, what next for uh, artificial intelligence in the resource sector. And, and this is kind of that learning about you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked so well. One of the things that's really coming into focus for us is that it, if we're going to really make this next level, if we're going to really achieve those gains in efficiency that we're all hoping for, that this is going to be probably a more of a hybridized solution that's going to be about the coming together of human know-how and artificial intelligence. Because what we're discovering is that to really breathe magic into this and to really deliver the value, that the domain-specific knowledge is still very important, certainly more important than we thought it was going to be at the outset of this journey. And what we're seeing is that the current, the narrow AI applications very frequently are lacking that contextual awareness. And if we really want to get the big breakthroughs in the future, uh, it's going to require the, tapping into the deep technical know-how of resource sector professionals and the companies that, that employ them. So for example, uh, in the mining sector, you're going to want people who have a deep understanding of the physical models and not just kind of cutting cutting loose the, the digital toolbox on the data with no regard for the underpinning physical models. Knowing the models, understanding the models is actually going to matter quite a bit. Next slide. So what does this mean? Well, among the things that this is pointing towards is that uh, it's very unlikely that we're going to see Silicon Valley or whatever other digital uh, champions you, you might uh, ha have your eye on, uh, that they won't probably be swaggering in and completely pushing aside all of the industry incumbents. Uh, what they don't have is that long, deep knowledge uh, of, uh, of that domain expertise. So it was probably more likely that we're going to see a basically a marriage of convenience happen here, where the Googles of the world are going to continue to collaborate with industry incumbents in those resource sectors. And that's all the material I had prepared, uh, but I realized I, I kind of probably uh, have to kind of uh, shrink this a little bit to make sure we're fitting our time budget in, in light of the fall start there. So if you have any questions, next slide, Harry, I'll do my level best to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. As, as with um, all of the other speakers, there's a, a volume of questions that are emerging in the chat room. And in fact, what's good is some of the chat room is actually talking to themselves. So that's uh, some of the answers we don't have to provide. Um, I had a question prepared in advance. Um, it's kind of a Skynet kind of a question of, of <laughs> Elon Musk and what threat does AI represent for humanity? Um, but if I can come back, in addition to the bigger question, which you're welcome to answer, look at a more mundane set of issues. Um, 
there's the question of invasion of privacy and the resilient of resilience of networks uh, against hacking. Uh, there's the whole data management and data storage. And if you think about the amount of data and the amount of energy that's required for the cooling of the data centers, this promised land of AI is not without its own consequences. Do you have any remarks on that? So not only do I have some remarks on it, I can see Julian enthusiastically nodding. So I'm not the only guy who who's aware of the situation here. This is a dated statistic. I don't even know exactly what the numbers would be today. But I remember reading uh, that the 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 uh, the amount of electricity that was consumed by the the da the data farms of the world, the servers. Uh, that that amount at that time, again, this is a few years ago, that it basically was equal to another Australia uh, in terms of electrical consumption. And I have no doubt that it's only grown from there. So we are talking about very significant amounts of energy that get consumed by these things. Um, I, I don't, I am aware of the problem. I don't know exactly how that's going to get solved. I do know they, they do try to make some obvious uh, shortcuts uh, in, in terms of it, just the simple thermodynamics of putting server farms up in really northern locations and then, you know, trying to use cold seawater uh, as a heat sink uh, to, to, to deal with some of the problem there. But um, that's that makes some of a dent in the problem, but certainly doesn't make it all go away. So I don't have the long term prognosis to how to solve this completely. Julian, I'm very happy to defer on that one if. Uh, if the, the passionately nodding head in any way translates to <laughs> a know-how on that one. Let me keep going on one other area because this was specific okay. on resources. Um, yep. The question was asked uh, whether you consider AI to be an advantage dealing with fuzzy data or poor quality data because a lot of resource estimates are based on human experience and judgment calls that aren't necessarily facts that emerge from a spreadsheet. Um, I would imagine that there's some patterns that AI might pick out. I don't know if you have any experience on the quality of the results that you get. I don't personally have experience with that, but I would say that that what you just said there sounds it passes the sniff test. It sounds logically you know, very reasonable to me. And that is, you know, uh, we do have statistical toolkits that help us to deal with fuzziness. This is one of the big developments that happened in the big data uh, revolution that's happened over the last decade or two is that we've got better at managing our way through fuzziness and incomplete data sets. Um, so I, I think that the good news is the cavalry has arrived on that one. We do have statistical toolkits that can infer uh, data and fill holes and and find things that are pr almost certainly spurious and kind of get in there and fix them before we can go forward with the analysis. I think that that has huge strides have been made on that one. I wouldn't chalk that necessarily up to AI. I think that that's kind of part and parcel of the, the big advances that happen in big data. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, for the sake of time, I think I will have to go back to um, our um, speaker sequence. Um, but again, you're not going to get away easy. I'm sure there'll be other questions coming <laughs> back to you.